Hey, and welcome to another episode of the Ice Cream for Everyone podcast, where play meets strategy. I'm your host, Willem van der Horst, and I'm a brand and marketing strategy consultant, and I specialize in studying and practicing everything to do with play, in particular tabletop games and storytelling role-playing games. And in these episodes, I have fantastic conversations on a wide variety of topics with a variety of guests. And for the first time in this episode, I am talking with two different guests. Awesome, awesome conversation. So, and, and also another first time is that I'm just starting, I just started doing demos of games as part of the conversations and as part of the episode to share all these games and what happens in them with a lot more of my audience that tends to be professionals within communications and marketing industries and trying to cross and build bridges between my passion points in gaming and my passion for my work. Uh, and I've handed the reins to leading this game to Dina, one of the two guests. So this is how it went. Uh, Dina is here. Yeah, here. Uh, Dina Ramsey is a uh, amateur game designer. She's a traveler. I mean, we've all like all the guests here are, are world travelers have been like traveling and working at various points. And I was in Paris for the conversation, Dina in Finland and Ashley in Los Angeles. Uh, and Dina is an amateur game designer. She works with businesses on social media marketing and on marketing advice to help game design businesses and game publishers to promote their games to their audience and communicating with their audience. Among other things, she's interested in a lot of different things. She also participates in a number of games, including Interest B that we're going to be playing or uh, we're, we're playing a demo of it. She's currently working on a game called Tales of Sempo. And Ashley is somebody that I was in touch with last year uh, when I was writing a guest newsletter edition for Strands of Genius, uh, the newsletter, the email newsletter from Ferris and Rosie Jacob uh, of Genius Steals, and uh, she works with them. So she works, she's a master on everything to do with creative production, project management, and helps a number of businesses with all, all sorts of initiatives. And uh, both Dina and Ashley also happen to be hard of hearing and deaf. And uh, when I found that out, and I discovered through a Twitter conversation with Dina, and I was looking at her profile. And then I thought about Ashley and I thought about the fact that I've been focusing for the past five years on audio podcasts without really ever thinking of the fact that some people might be hearing impaired and might not be able to listen to it. And I thought, well, this is interesting. Uh, what if I, and I've been wanting to do an episode that mixes in somebody coming from my interest in gaming and somebody coming from more of my kind of communications and marketing world turned out that actually they're both belonging to the same world and they've both traveled a lot like I have. Um, so we have a conversation with all about all of this stuff and I'll let you discover it. And Dina takes us through a demo of Itras B that she participated in. Itras is a game that I've been looking forward to trying. I heard a lot of fantastic things and I'm looking forward to playing a longer session. And Ashley wasn't really familiar with storytelling and role-playing games and really just went with it. And we had a lot of fun. Uh, Itras is a surrealistic game that Dina describes during the episode uh, where all the characters that you play uh, wander around this surrealistic 1920s cent city setting. Um, and I think that's about it. Otherwise, if you want to find out more stuff about me, don't forget you can find everything out on the website. That's a www dot ice cream for everyone dot net you can like subscribe comment tweet at icy villain for me and dina and ashley can be found on their websites uh um ashley darrington.com that she gives a little bit later dina's on twitter at dina said so dina said so one i believe and without further ado here we go for the conversation that i had with ashley and dina enjoy Hey, Ashley and Dina, thank you for joining me and welcome to the show. I usually say welcome to the show first, but I switched things around this time. I'm, I'm not used to get, I was just saying, I'm not used to having two different people at the same time. So this is brand new, brand new for me. Hi. Um, hi. Hi. Happy to be here. <laughs> Great. Thank you. So as way of an intro, uh, as a lot of different things in the way that I, I was going to say plan, not exactly plan, but just spot opportunities and remember things and make connections between different things going on at the same time. So this is obviously the Ice Cream for Everyone podcast and the subtitle is Where Play Meets Strategy. I'm Willem van der Horst. I call myself a playful strategist. I'm into tabletop games, role-playing games, storytelling games in particular, as well as board games, that I look at studying play as a behavior in games overall and how to integrate that in my work with businesses and brands and have fun talking about it with the guests I have on the show. 
And uh, I was chatting on Twitter and Dina replied to a tweet that I did about uh, Jason Morningstar and Fiasco, uh, the new uh, uh, role-playing game. And uh, I checked out her profile and I saw that Dina is among other things, well, a player, a gamer, a designer, and also had noted that she's hard of ear and hearing. And I thought, oh, there's a really interesting gaming space, hard of hearing person. I remembered that I was in touch with Ashley last year uh, when I did a contributing uh, edition of a newsletter of the Strands of Genius newsletter with uh, Rosie and Faris Jakob, and Ashley works with Rosie and Faris, and I remember your website was uh, deaf, tattooed, and I can't employed. Remember now, traveling. Employed, that's the one, I'm yeah. sorry. So I thought, oh, there's an interesting triptych going on because, uh, so none of us know each other. However, Dina and I have probably like some links or shared knowledge experience in tabletop role-playing games. Uh, Ashley and Dina at the very least, and I'm sure we'll find out other things that we're, we're linked by, but Ashley and I through the world of creative communications as well as traveling around the world, maybe Dina too, I don't know, uh, and working and traveling because I did my a little bit of digital nomadism and uh, working and traveling around the world. And Ashley and Dina that have in common this uh, being deaf and hard of hearing. And I thought, well, actually this is, I never, it just was not part of my world to think about that as a condition. I was like, well, I, I thought I'd start an audio podcast five years ago, but I didn't think for a second that maybe some people would not be able to listen to it at all. Uh, and it's something that I didn't know. And I thought, well, what if we organize something of a podcast episode with the three of us to share everything to do with traveling and gaming and finding for me to find out a little bit more about the world of the deaf and hard of hearing people at the same time. Um, so that's a little bit of premise. And as we exchange emails, uh, Dina offered to give us a bit of a demo of a game that I have heard amazing things about and I'm very excited called Itras B, or how do you pronounce it actually? Itras B. Itras B. Uh, and that's it's a game of surreal of surrealism i don't know how how do you yeah so it's a 1920 surrealistic role playing experience i think i'm going to call it experience it's obviously a really good game because it, it you know it's proper thick and stuff and uh this was uh written like 15 years ago now i think it is um, it was the first role playing game that i actually got to be sort of a part of i've wrote some of the um, uh, chance cards that is in the game. I was in as a proofreader, so this is the first game I ever proofread. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it really launched me into the gaming community in Norway, where I'm from, and uh, started off uh, a very exciting journey for me. So for the past 15 years, you know, I've been uh, singing the graces of this game because I think it's absolutely brilliant. It's a quite low threshold role playing game. It doesn't have all these dice and fiddly bits. Um, yeah, so I've been traveling around Europe for the past 10 years, um, living in six different countries. And in every single one of them, I've managed to run at least four games of this. Awesome. So another, th so the three of us are travelers. And actually, if you don't mind just giving us a bit of a fuller intro about who you are, Dina, at the same time. Yeah, so uh, I'm I'm Gina. I'm from Norway. I live in Finland, and I am a uh, marketing and community specialist. I work for Sarna Interactive. It's a reading app for romance and erotica. <laughs> and um, for the, the 15 years now, I've been running and playing role-playing games. Yeah. It's going to be 17, but yeah, let's pretend it's just 15. <laughs> it doesn't make me sound so old. <laughs> um, I've written like four games, none of them like really good or anything, but I'm currently working on one game that I think is going to be pretty awesome. Uh, that is just reaching its playtestable state. So I'm super excited to get that tested in two weeks. Um, I am um, in the board gaming community. I have been helping out on a couple of Kickstarters. Uh, I started out with Tale of Sampo in February, March. Uh, this year and since then I've really dived into the board gaming community with helping out with marketing and community strategies in terms of uh, getting their games out there and knowing what to use with the social media since that's really my jam and connecting people and it was fun when we were reaching out to me because I was literally changing my my Twitter status two days prior to 
including that I am hard of hearing because I figured, you know, I, I got to start this journey of, of you know, accepting that I, I do actually hear things a little bit different than others and mm -hmm. that I have certain challenges in this community of, of games uh, that someone might not know how to combat and, and uh, you know, creating space for, for others to, to talk about the things that we notice and I, uh, I have a, a friend of mine who is blind and she's been a really good advocate and like paving forward for me in order to start talking and, and creating these kind of conversations. And she's a like a diversity specialist here in Finland. So it, it's, it really gave me a little bit of a platform to jump out from. And I was like, yeah, two days after <laughs> I have like two people who do podcasts and like, hey, let's talk about you being hard of hearing. And I'm like, um, <laughs> where do I start? Wow. That was really cool. Awesome. Thank you so much. And so I see uh, that there's a lot more uh, similarities or things that are possibly shared, actually, now that we're talking a little bit more. How about you, Ashley? Can you give us a bit of an intro, please? Sure. Uh, I'm based in the U.S. right now. I grew up outside of Atlanta, Georgia, and have been in L.A. Uh, more or less the last seven years, but uh, call the road home. I 2018, I was in 23 different countries. Last year was a little bit fewer, uh, staying in places a little bit longer. And I moved to LA to work in entertainment. So I worked in entertainment marketing for a few years, realized that was not my path and decided to quit my job and travel. And that kind of just led to a myriad of things. And I started finding jobs online, working remotely, uh, mostly in the writing sector. And then got connected to Rosie Ferris and then just work has built from there, mostly in operations, project management, um, creative producing. So I have a couple of clients in the advertising, qualitative research, strategy space. Um, I have one that in more of the emotional intelligence, um, meditation, mindfulness space. And then I actually, uh, kind of similar to Dina, I did not really embrace my hearing loss growing up. I was mainstream, meaning I went to a school with hearing children. I did not rely on sign language as my primary form of communication. I relied a lot on lip reading and I wear hearing aids. And so when I decided to travel, my kind of personal challenge to myself was to learn about the deaf and hard of hearing community in different places that I traveled and started writing about that, which actually led to a paid opportunity with Hearing Like Me, which is a hearing law communication or community put on by Phonak, the largest manufacturer of hearing aids in the world. And my role with them has, has evolved over the last couple of years. I do a lot in social media, community management and writing and blogging and um, just trying to spread awareness around that as well, because that was not something that I was fully prepared for growing up. I think that... Um, it was a part of me, but I never fully understood what that meant. And I also play for the U.S. Women's National Deaf Soccer Team. Um, and that's a huge spectrum. Of, we call it the deaf spectrum because there's so many um, points on that spectrum of people with hearing loss. And uh, that really taught me a lot. And so, yeah, uh, I'm not as in, in tune with the gaming world, um, but I love playing games. I definitely... Um, into like the physical aspect. And I was telling Willem actually that I've been playing around with the idea of how physical games or games from your childhood can actually um, maybe help people understand and communicate with people with disabilities, not just uh, deaf and hard of hearing. And um, yeah, so that's a little bit about me. Awesome, thank you so much. So, I mean, this is not something I want to necessarily talk throughout the whole thing, but given I know very little and maybe people who might be listening or watching this know very little as well. Um, a, a bit, so, and you just talked about the spectrum of, of deafness and hard of hearing. So I imagine it goes from nothing at all to different frequencies to hearing more or less to hearing differently, maybe that I don't know what it is. Uh, and you mentioned, Ashley, that you have hearing aids and you and I believe you've been both mainstreamed, which is, uh, well, yes. no sign language. I, I don't know how, how common these things are. And I guess the main question, aside from any comment that comes to mind from what I'm saying, but is um, 
what is what might be important for people that are just generally hearing to be mindful of whether it is for us having this conversation right now or for putting content out there so that people who are hard of hearing can easily consume it and this is something that i wasn't thinking about before but now i know i have to go back to all my captions i just started putting video out recently and i just learned because i started watching a few videos on hearing like me as preparation for this and learning a few things uh, such as that the automatically generated captions are really bad, which is not that surprising after all, but I wasn't yeah. sure thinking about it. It's interesting because today I was received a notification that YouTube is actually going to remove the user-based captions that's been added uh, to their videos. And for me, you know, that's been so important to have the captions there uh, in order to be able to consume media on YouTube. So, you know, that was like such a, a hit in the face sort of feeling that, because this is, you know, something that I really rely upon. Yeah. And I think uh, part of it too is accents as you're starting to travel across the world or you're listening to people in different parts of the world, those captions really do help just to clarify some of those words that, you know, the enunciation might be different. And so um, I read that too, or somebody tech to be about it um, because it's become such an, an easy thing. Uh, it doesn't work all the time, but you can start to kind of gather, oh, okay, that's what they meant here, even though yeah. that word's a little bit off. Um, and I think that like my, my soccer team, we kind of say we have a range of people who only rely on sign language, don't wear any devices, all the way to people who wear devices and rely solely on spoken word, or um, I rely primarily on lip reading. Um, and so right now in the world of mask and you know, going out for safety, wearing masks can be very difficult because they already have said that when you put on mask, it already lowers your um, frequency or the, the audio level and the clarity of it. So regardless of if you're hearing or hard of hearing, it's challenging for everybody. And so there's an added level of uh, anxiety, at least for me, when I go out to try to communicate with people. Um, and so I would say, and those are, that's like a new world for us right now to navigate that. And I think for a lot of us, we've assimilated to the normal um, just because we were mainstream. So we grew up without I, I was stubborn. I didn't like accommodation. Um, I didn't like being uh, addressed that I was different. I think I saw people with disabilities around me who were treated a certain way and that, so I kind of overcompensated. I would, everything I was learning in school, I would reread later so that I was up to date and, and kind of on par with, with my classmates. Um, and I always say that, you know, video, or any opportunity to be able to see somebody because a lot of times we miss certain words here and there. So the body language helps fill in the story. And so um, there's a lot, everybody had a different way of how they receive communication. And um, so I can't speak for all of deaf and hard of hearing because everybody is very different. Um, and I think that's one of the coolest things about it is that we're not, we have a lot in common, but we also have a lot that's very different because of that. Yeah, like in my case, you know, I would read all the books at school the first week so that I would know kind of what, was, what to expect that the teacher was going to start talking about. And then I would be the person who would know all the answers. And they were like, wow, you're really paying attention. And I'm like, no, I'm just trying to <laughs> he listen. Like, I'm trying to understand what you're saying. Because, you know, Female teachers for me was like the worst. They would very often like mumble. They would be far away from where I was sitting. So I would have like a special seat and everyone was like, oh, Dina can't hear anything. And they were like, I was treated very differently with also being, you know, the brightest child in the class kind of thing, because I, you know, I was trying to, you know, really pay attention on like, what are they saying? Lip reading. It seems like I'm, I'm really there in all the meetings and on, on, in the classroom. But really, it's just me compensating because I, as, as Ashley, I was also mainstreamed and I was mainstreamed in a really small village that had you know, hardly any people who were different. We had one blind, uh, one deaf girl in our class and she got sort of squeezed out after two months and she just like the whole family moved. There was, in the village where I grew up, there was like one black kid 
uh, and he received so much abuse and it happened to me with my foster brother. So I got to see so much of, of how he was different and how he was treated and I didn't want to be different. And by, by the time I was in fourth grade, I would take, you know, migraine tablets like, for painkillers just to cope with classes because I was lip reading so much. And yeah, so I was born with no hearing at all on one side. And as I grew up, it, it gets, you know, m my range is lower and lower on the other side. So at this point, I have probably like one fourth normal hearing. Uh, and I'm still not wearing a hearing aid, but I probably should. So I, I rely really much on lip reading in my everyday. Thank you. And I was going to ask you, so given you've lived in different countries, did you learn to lip read in different languages? Yeah, I am. Yeah. <laughs> I'm pretty good. Like, I, you, you have to compensate. Right. Uh, <laughs> I lived in Wales for a while and the, the Welsh dialect was actually re a lot easier for me to lip read with how they speak. And from when I was living in, in Northern Ireland in Belfast for a while, like how they were speaking is so different and the way their lips are moving. It's like, it is like meeting, meeting an entirely different language. So I'm like relearning how English is supposed to, you know, how the lips are moving and how the, they sound because of their accent. Yes. Well, when you have the audio, you do have to relearn a lot of that too. I, so I was born in the States and I'm not saying it's the same. I'm, I'm just trying to find experiences mm. to match and uh, to try to find my, find personal experiences that might match what you're saying without saying that it's yeah. the same. Right? Relateness is super yeah, important exactly. in these kind of things. Exactly. And, uh, and for a lot of people, well, either learning uh, French people, learning English or any other language. So obviously I have more of an American twang. I was born in the States and then raised in France. And then when I moved to the UK, I realized how much I did not understand any of the other accents than kind of just, you know, Londoner or mainstream English, let's say, or more posh English. Yeah. So anybody coming from Ireland who had a little bit of a tougher accent or Northern Ireland, Ireland, Scotland, I mean, it's a little bit stereotypical, but still it was impressive. I was like, I have no idea what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> so cool. Thank you. All right. So I, I actually, I, I, another question. So changing topic a little bit, but thank you very much for this. This is really interesting. Uh, Ashley, so you have as your tagline on your website also that you're tattooed. So it seems like that's an important aspect of you. I was wondering if you wanted to comment on that or maybe share a story of one of your favorite tattoos or something like that. Sure. I think that my whole, I think growing up subconsciously, I was always trying to defy the norms and stereotypes. Um, in another way before kind of tackling my hearing loss. And I think that was my way of, of preparing myself for that moment when I did outright say, hey, I'm, I'm deaf. Um, and so that kind of was the inspiration for my website uh, or that kind of project, the deaf tattoo did employed. I you know, have purple hair, as you might be able to see. I have over 10 tattoos and working on more. And I you know, then obviously have hearing loss, so I don't fit the, the resume norm of what somebody may look for when they're um, applying for a job or, or recruiting somebody for a job. And so that was kind of the, the narrative that I wanted to share. And, uh, and, and because I was a straight A student, 4.0 GPA, like those don't, that, like tattooed, don't necessarily, are, are, uh, more traditional connotation of tattoo don't fit that way but I've always viewed tattoo to be very much an artistic form of expression and very much a storytelling aspect and so I actually have on my left side I have a, what I'm calling my like family tree of life and then I have three elements in there and each of them represent one of my family members so I have a son which is my mom she's from Southern California the, the outdoors beach it's like her favorite space and it very much identifies who she is um, my sister's nickname is peanut and so she i got a little peanut in the roots of the tree and then my dad is a very much like a guy's guy he doesn't know how to dress but he's okay with that and he uh, he grew up here in the states and was in the service uh, served in vietnam special forces and he grew up in a very 
challenging household. And so his entire life was um, about kind of like trying to survive. And then he wanted to, his entire like life goal dream was to be able to afford to buy himself a Shelby Cobra GT500, like quintessential American muscle car kind of thing. And so I have wrapped around the tree a Cobra um, that modeled after the Shelby Cobra design. Um, I decided to eliminate the fangs. I didn't want to look that aggressive. Um, and so that's kind of, family's been very important to me and they've always been super supportive of me being the individual that I am and want to be. And so that's one of the things that I have on my side. And a lot of people, if I go out to the beach and take my shirt off, they're always surprised that my entire side is covered. And so, um, yeah, that's probably one of the most important ones that I have. Awesome. Thank you. Cool. All right. So I think I'm going to put, we're going to segue into the game experience and, um, and I'm going to hand over to Dina. I was going to say something about surrealism and you can correct me after that or, or co correct or add anything to what I have to say. And I was just recently looking at that for something else. Because uh, I was I was playing another role playing game called Invisible Sum that has a uh, surrealistic aspect to it, and uh, and I like the definition that is in the Tate Modern, and I also I thought there might be interesting segues in discussing how reality occurs and reality occurs differently for every one of us, and even more so perhaps if you have different kinds of conditions that you think don't fit the norm, and there's a lot of work that was done by the surrealistic movement at the time. Uh, that comes into it, but but it comes into it differently. But I thought there was maybe an interesting connection to be made about the fact that the world occurs differently for all of us. So just as a either a reminder or to explain to anybody who doesn't know, and, and also to get us into playing the game, because I think, Ashley, you haven't played uh, role-playing games before, right? I have not. I've, I've done like, I guess, I don't know if you guys correct me if this is wrong, but I've done like you know, dinner parties where you dress up and then you do play like that role. Um, I've done, we called it LARPing. I don't know if that was the thing that you guys, sure. that was the thing that we did in um, high school was we would dress up and, uh, you know, use a shoe or the sword or something. But um, so I've done definitely more of the physical like role playing um, kind of in a space. Yeah. And so well, that's, that's probably like, to me, I mean, Dina experience. will say, but I believe that if you've done any of that, or even if you've played any make-believe game as a kid, you have all that's needed to be like to get started and to make sure. And like, I don't think there's anything any more scary than that, particularly any not for this kind of demo. Uh, I don't think. I mean, uh, and so just circling back, I'll finish on the definition of surrealism, then I'll hand over to Dina. So uh, it was a tw so according to the definition of the Tate Modern that I quite like, a 20th century literary, philosophical, and artistic movement that explored the workings of the mind, championing the irrational, the poetic, and the revolutionary. Uh, and it was born as a movement after the First World War and the destruction and mayhem and everything and you know the suffering that it caused. So there was a, a strong uh, positive streak to the movement uh, and it aimed to revolutionize the human experience, rejecting a rational vision of life in favor of one that asserted the value of the unconscious and dreams. So the movement's poets and artists found magic and strange beauty in the unexpected and the uncanny, the disregarded and the unconventional. So it matches a little bit of also what we've been speaking about, I think, and what Ashley, you mentioned. And there's a lot of work in surrealism that is about juxtaposing, putting things together that don't seem to belong together. And, I, and I, so there's uh, a lot of work on that side. So, I think it's interesting for the conversation. And now I've not played the game and Dina's gonna, uh, Dina's gonna lead us through it. So I don't know if there's anything, because you've worked on it so much and played it so much, anything more you wanna say about surrealism or the game itself or, and just anything to get us ready. So I'll just hand over to you. All right, <laughs> thank you. Um, I think uh, surrealistic games makes it easy to enter. Um, some people can find role-playing games a little bit challenging or difficult to even start with because where do you start? Uh, obviously, we all say that, oh, but it's so easy. It's like make-believe. But a lot of people have these mental blocks of like, this is not cool enough or they, they feel like uh, the internal 
threshold for starting out to even open their mouth can be really high sometimes because you want to sound cool. And at least with surrealistic games, I find that, that you lower the threshold automatically because with that word, uh, you're allowing for a lot of randomosity, uh, which is why I really like to, to use these kind of games as sort of an entry level. Um, while the game itself, it's, you know, it's, uh, it's really fancy and it has all these uh, drawings, um, that are, you know, there's a lot of, of things happening and it can seem maybe even more intimidating uh, on the cover to grab it, which is why I was really happy when Norwegian Style came out that they included a short version of, of Itras in it. So to really, you know, um, let more people see them and also, you know, to lower that threshold a little bit um, to, to make people feel a bit braver. With, with these sort of role-playing games, the most important part is to say yes. Never hesitate yourself. Don't doubt yourself. Whatever you have in you that wants to come out, there is a room and space for it. It's going to be good because you're allowing your, your, you know, your imagination to just unfold together with the group. Cool. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I've done games in like pubs. I've done games at conventions with these sort of games. And for me, I think every person has a story that they have inside them that they want to tell. And sometimes they just need the right medium. And, and I think a storyteller or a game master or dungeon master, whatever you want to call it, I don't really like the master part of it. So let's call it a storyteller. Uh, I think what their job is, is to help people give them the, the space and you know the medium to tell the stories that everyone have inside them to, to come out. I'm just there to help everyone around the table to channel their own fantasies and imaginations and just unfold. And together we're having this immersive experience that can really help build empathy and it can help build connections I've had games where people have been crying, you know, they've been laughing and, and they will talk about it years later. Uh, just a couple of weeks ago, I had a friend of mine saying, oh my gosh, Dean, I remember this game you ran for me 14 years ago. I still think it was the coolest thing ever happened. And, you know, this is why I do the things I do. Uh, it is for those everlasting storytelling moments because as humans, we are storytellers. We're born to tell stories. And in the modern society, we often have this, you know, anxieties for, is it good enough? Is it cool enough? Am I okay the way I am? And I think games can help to say that, yes, no matter what you have to offer, you are good enough. Awesome. Yeah, love that. Wow. <laughs> Motions, feeling, feeling the things right now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. So what do we do? What happens in Itras B? I know that it's a city in the 20s, but for our okay. little short, what are we so going to do for a little a, demo thing? Yeah. So it's not just a little town in, okay. in the 20s. It is an entire world on itself. So I'll show you the map in the game. Okay. It looks like this. Uh, it's literally just the smallest little village or town that has a, a river running through it. It's like a super basic map with a couple of spots that are special to the people who live in it. Around this village or the town, there's a fog, a thick fog where everything can happen. You will go into the fog and you'll, maybe you will return, maybe not. Maybe you'll return 20 or 50 years later. It could have been for you, don't only a moment. You could have entered into another world, but you cannot enter the fog and, and know where you will end up. It is in the fog that things will happen. The magical stories will unfold, and so also in the town. In, in Itras, they have a little harbor that has ships coming in and out at all times. They will bring with them goods, and, and they will take treasures with them out. They have magical stories to tell about islands that are under the ocean. They have stories to tell about visiting the stars and other galaxies. In Itras, the only thing that exists is the town of Itras. In the middle of it, there's a big tower. Inside it, 
there was someone that they may call a god. Some say that it never really happened. But Nindra is, you know, the, the symbol of the unity of the people. And it's been 2,000 years. Nobody's ever seen the person enter or leave. Some say that they don't exist anymore. It's, uh, it's, things happen. There are streets in Itras that are only there on Fridays. There are other streets where there is only, like, every day is a Monday. You'll rush through it and you'll always forget, oh, I forgot my wallet, you have to go back. You'll remember all the things that, oh, I should have done this, I should have done that. Uh, and those can be really challenging to meet. You know, you're just around a corner and all of a sudden, you know, it's Monday. You get hit with that Monday feeling. And, ah, oh, it must be in the Monday street. And, and the town allows for so much fun things to happen. Um, there is a, a little group of people called the Futurists. They will build machines from technologies that they get from, from the boats that comes into the harbor. And they also go into the fog as explorers to seek uh, new things, the new worlds. They have a little train there that goes into the fog and they'll tell the wonder of tales. But not everyone gets to use the trains. It's only the richest and the finest who can do it and to dare to go there. But sometimes people come back different than what they were when they left. And in this world is where we will find our characters. In in each of us, the, the character generation is quite simple. It is basically us sitting down and saying, what sort of story do we want to tell? What is important for us today? So I'll bring that question to you. What sort of game would you want it to be? Ashley, do you have an idea or something that comes to mind? Ooh, lot to process. I'm like imagining all the scenarios of what's <laughs> happening on these streets. And I know. So, sorry, do you mind refraining, like, yeah. sharing that question again? No. Yeah. <laughs> so, what sort of game would you want it to be? What do you think is, like, if you were to give me a keyword, saying, I want this game to be about... I want this game to be about community. Community. That's a great word. And then I'll ask Wilhelm, what is a word that you will add to our game? I'm going to add misfit. Misfit. Hmm. <laughs> That's a good one. And with that, we have already set the premises for what sort of game we will have. In it, we will have our characters. Um, you can choose to line it up to either these two keywords, community or misfit, or you can go with something a little bit different. Maybe in the game, we will explore how we are all misfits, or maybe it, for your character, it's gonna be primarily about the community. So, Ashley, what sort of character do you think would live in Itras? What is their name or personality? Personality. I, I'm imagining, I'm going to say myself. I'm going to do purple hair. I'm going to do um, kind of a girly girl, but also uh, a little bit of a, a wild child. Um, more to, to fit that misfit, I think. Somebody who mm -hmm. liked to go by the river, maybe jump in the water, which she's not supposed to, um, hangs with the guys, uh, kind of that um, outcast, sort of the or traditional sense of the word outcast. Um, that's kind of the character I'm, I'm envisioning. Brilliant. And uh, Willem? I, I, I just had the idea of being a street, uh, like having a street cart of a, a salesperson of some kind or a purveyor of goods. I have little, I don't know, I thought of a street cart with little vials of sand that is colored in all sorts of different colors. I love it. People in the neighborhood buy from me. Mm. And what is in the vials? Uh, is it sand? Is it dreams? It's sand. Are you maybe selling mag magical potions? uh it's sand that uh that flavors dreams oh it just kind of enhances or flavors dreams based on the different types of sand that uh that i sell so if i were to go to you i could get myself a vial that would flavor a romance story 
for example, yeah, uh, or a romance story or a, uh, a story where, you know, if you're feeling a little bit down and work has been a little bit difficult, maybe you can dream something that would be, you know, a happy memory or you overcoming really big obstacles in your life. I could have that kind of vial of a green powdered sand beach that comes from the far reaches of beyond the fog. Mm. So do you venture yourself into the fog or do you have a conveyor? I think I don't go myself. I, 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 I have people who, so I talk to people who come back from it. Mm. And Does or, this group, yeah. yeah. Do they have a name, this group? Um, I, I think it's just not necessarily a group, but independent explorers that don't necessarily have a name. I have my network of people that go out there and sometimes uh, get the sand for me. So you have a network of explorers. Yes. That's great. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, the, I'm the one that's trying to steal the little vial from you. So I'm really? the one that okay, pastures that. you. I'm I kind like of that. like my team of, of uh, misfits. We kind of tag team, you know, one talking to you while the other one tried to try to find the different little vials that, fit what we're looking for and maybe we're going to resell them ah okay. so you know each other we do that's we do. great it's, it's, maybe it's one time safe. you accidentally took a vial and you unleashed a dragon in your own dreams Ooh, that would be i would blame him yeah i, I would too <laughs> that's not that's not what i signed up for i <laughs> blame him i go back to find the vial that would get rid of the dragon yeah Maybe something happened. Maybe the dragon escaped your dreams because of this and then uh, set upon Etras and crashed down in the library. Oh, that's so sad. I would hate well, to lose all those books. He'd um, probably sit on top and, and be a librarian. Maybe he always dreamed about being a librarian. Nice. That would be cool. That would be very cool. And maybe, maybe we befriend the dragon at that point. We all have yeah. this association that the dragon is... Not our friend, but it can be. And uh, would you like to give this dragon a name? I'd like to give this dragon a name. Hmm. I will go with. I kind of want something simple. Let's go with Bob. Bob the dragon. Bob the dragon. I love it. I used to have a drawing on my wall from a friend of mine with with the Bob the dragon, which is like <laughs> literally sitting on a pile of books. <laughs> Bob the dragon. I have to. I just have to say how. I mean, this is a slight aparte, but uh, you, you know, you kind of move. There's always a character named Bob in every role playing game. It's almost unavoidable, and it's a trope. So, Ashley, you're doing well. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. I've actually never had a Bob in any of my role playing games. No, there's, uh, I have wow. like a lot, you know, there's a random Maybe character. This character, what's his character's name? Uh, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> I, that could I, be the cultural uh, thing, right? Maybe it's, it yeah. it's more of an American name that uh, Possibly. we use frequently. I, I have friends who are like, let's start with the letter A um, and then you'll end up with something uh, that probably sounds a little bit Middle Eastern or Asian. Uh, on the name A, There's so many strings. Like I have, yeah, in my in my collection of role play playing characters, I think I have like half of them ha is A something. <laughs> what about you, Dina? What's your character? She, well, I am the storyteller oh, in this. Oh. Yes, I'm gonna move the world. <laughs> I'll be all the NPCs. Non-playing characters. Yes, non-playing So characters. for the, the jargon. You know, there's a lot of jargon in advertising and marketing. There's a lot of jargon in tabletop yeah. games too. That okay. it is. Mm. So we'll move on to the next in the character creation, which is we already touched upon the personality. Um, but in this game, everyone has what is called a dramatic ability. It is something that only you can do. It could be as mundane as having purple hair, but in this game, it will be special in the sense that maybe everyone will notice you because you do have purple hair and it's a particular shade of purple that maybe sparkles uh, in the sunlight and everyone likes you because of it, or maybe they're jealous. It could be that you're the best salesman of sand dreams in the whole town or maybe you do have a terrible pitch when you're doing sales and should really just shut up. <laughs> um, 
Actually, I don't know if you. Hmm. I like where you've taken me on the the sparkly hair, but um, I want I I think I'm going to go in the route that the purple hair and the distraction for the ability that I can teleport. So you you do identify me, but I can teleport so I can vanish in the in the snap of a finger and be in another part of each of us. Cool. And Just so you uh, just see like sparks of my hair kind of flying out in and out of the, the clouds or the space. So in my peripheral vision, I'll see something purple. And I'll know yeah. that uh, you just popped out or in. Yes. Like, oh, she's here. Very cool. Brilliant. Yeah. So your dramatic ability is that you can teleport. <gasps> that is awesome. Wilhelm. Mine is, uh, let's see. Um, I'm not sure. I really like the idea of a bad pitch. At first, I was thinking that maybe as I talk to people, they can notice that the sand changes color and it actually changes color based on what I'm trying to sell them, unless or or that was something. Um, um, Maybe you're the nicest person around and you have a big heart. Yeah. Maybe when Ashley's character is stealing your son, you can't help but feel a little bit sorry for them or you want to let them have it and you never report them. Sure. Yeah, in the sense, yeah, absolutely. Like the, the reason why I do what I do is that I, I want people to feel better and to have nice, mm. and the way that I do that is to give them nice dreams. Not give them, try to make a living out of it, but yeah. Like little kids, you know, I'm, I may well be known for not reporting people or sometimes giving them a vial if I see that they seem to be in need for whatever reason or helping out in the neighborhood. And if someone comes up to you and says, can I get a vial of really bad, horrible dreams? My husband has been tormenting me for weeks. Would you do it? Oh, that's a very good question. Um, I, w I would ask them a little bit more and try to gauge whether that's actually true or not. Mm. Uh, and, and if it is, I would, I, I would give it, but I would probably also encourage them to probably see what they could do with their own, you know, family, or if they have a way to possibly leave if it's that bad or, but depending on the situation, I may well give it to them. Yeah. Yeah, you sound like a very positive and, and uh, yeah, a happy fella. That's nice. So, uh, big heart. I'll write that down. All right. <laughs> um, we have also, a, a, we're going to do like intrigues in this game. So, obviously, I'm assuming maybe you have a rival salesman of this. Maybe, he's, maybe he has a better pitch than you, but his vials are terrible. He's uh, industrial. Industrial, yes. Yeah. He doesn't like, w w I work with people who really go out there and get the right kind of dreams. So it's kind of a patchwork of different things. Whereas he manufactures them because he draws them out of people's heads who work for him. Uh, mm. And so he does it on a grand scale. It's not craft dream making yeah. like mine. It's mass produced actually. Mass produced. And, pl and plus I believe that the people who work for him, who get their dreams extracted, turned into sand, uh, they suffer from it, I think. Yeah. Are we going to call this person the sand man? Uh, sure, why not? Unless you have I'm a keeping it easy. No, I, don't, I mean, I, <laughs> it, keeps it, it keeps it simple for now. The sand man, he walks around with his little children at night, and they sneak into the rooms, they pluck out dreams from people's heads into little vials that they run over. His little horde of children are maybe beggars and, 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 and foster kids. Possibly. And he runs a little uh, group there and they uh, live right next to the graveyard in their little caves, slithering out only at night. And Very what about nice. you, Ashley? my my rebel my like rival i actually think the fog is my rival i'm mm. i'm 
I'm the, I'm the misfit around, but the fog is, is, is my, my rival. I'm, I'm always standing next to it, but slightly too afraid to actually step into it. Um, and so I'm always kind of uh, playing cat and mouse with the fog. Is the fog also a personification that follows you around sometimes as you teleport Absolutely. around? Maybe you'll yeah. teleport and all of a sudden you've attracted the fog comes yes. next to you and your location. Absolutely. Definitely. You never know where the fog is. You never know where I am. Mm, that's a good one. Oh, I, can, I can imagine running <laughs> around. All of a sudden there's a little fog following you. Is it... Um, can you like make out any facial features or is it just like a shadow? I, I could see a little bit of fa facial features, kind of a round, plump face, maybe a little bit of a beard, um, mm. sort of cloud-like, a uh, little fluffy. Um, one of those that feel dividing, but at the same time, not, not quite sure how you, if you trust it enough. Yes. And... And uh, in this world, what sort of goals would your character have for their lives or uh, day? What is your struggles or dreams? She, she's got a Peter Pan personality. She, <laughs> she doesn't want to grow up. She's, uh, she's living in the, very much living in the now and just kind of playing that little tormentor and always wanting to go for boat rides, steal food, kind of live off the land a little bit. Um, and it's with whoever, whoever, whatever kids are kind of around in, in that moment. Um, and so maybe that's her, maybe that's how each of us kind of keeps her in that same day all the time. Um, mm. she, she doesn't have any big goals other than to, enjoy each day as it comes Good having one. fun playing around and uh, exploring she's definitely curious about things um, but not in the sense of what it means to be an adult and having certain responsibilities and how old is your character i'm gonna say she's about 13 13 as the cusp of adulthood Mm, so things are going to change. Yes. <laughs> and Villa, what about you? I am thinking one of my main struggles is while I would like to, like to alleviate some of the suffering or for people to feel better and to have a good night's sleep and nice dreams, I can't sleep. Ah. Uh, and I'm very tired. And I'm trying to understand why I can't sleep. One is one thing I think, mm -hmm. and um, and maybe something to do with my arrival, but I'm trying to work out what that would be. We can um, find that out during play. Okay, great. Yeah, that sounds like a good starting point. Okay, I think I have enough for us to start now. Um, is there any player like any friends? Do you want to add to the friends? Yes. Um, sure. One of the, one of the people that go exploring the fog that bring back sand for me. Mm -hmm. uh, What's their name? Uh, their name is Tang. Come again? Tang. Tang. What sort of person is Tang? Tang is a, uh, he's a big burly black man. Burly black man. Uh, yep comes across like very strong and confident mm. and he goes out i mean he's kind of he doesn't really say what he goes out to do but he told me he could find the sand quite easily so i mm. I, I, I thought okay <laughs> cool and uh, ashley i'm gonna have a unicorn a baby a unicorn baby unicorn with yeah matching hair Although hers is a little bit lighter, it's definitely a she. We're kind of partners in crime. Mm. And is this uh, baby unicorn about your height? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And she talks. She speaks. 
Yes, of course. Well, yeah. all the purple unicorns would talk. Yeah. But she has her, her ability, she can also shrink, so I could put her in my pocket. Uh, at will or randomly? Mm. I'm not sure. She hasn't quite that. learned, but it was obviously baby yes. unicorns. They haven't quite learned to use their powers yet. So Correct. all of a sudden, it's a pop. Uh, you'll teleport and uh, and uh, she'll come. Yeah, which is really really big. Later. And and maybe yeah. sometimes they drop off on during your teleport while they were tiny, yes. and then they'll be big and uh, no way near you. Yes, she's got a little bit of a character mentality. Sometimes, like a big you know puppy puppy dog when they've got big paws, they have not grown into them yet. She she has a little bit of that. Mm. Every time she shrinks, it comes back something a little bit. A little bit of out, of out of sync. Yeah. Awesome. So we managed to, yeah, flesh out the town a little with this. Is there anything else you'd like to add uh, before uh, I'll start our intro and I'll tell how the, the mechanics work in the game? Okay. I, I, no, I was just going to say, just want to make sure, um, just being mindful of time that we do yes. something and what you want to cover before we... Uh, to, so that we have a few more minutes to chat and uh, and talk about our experience of it. How much time do I have? How much time do you want? <laughs> oh, well, let's let's get a feel for it, shall we? All right, cool. Okay. Uh, In total, anything? so I'm thinking five ten minutes, if that's okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, cool. That's enough to get a feel for it. Great. Um, in Itras, the uh, game mechanics is not dice; it is actually cards. I will uh, pull out one so you can see. Uh, they're like this. On them, there will be, there's two different cards. There's a resolution card and a chance card. Uh, if you want something to happen, but you don't want to define it yourself, but you want to allow, you know, the dice or the randomosity to decide it, you'll say, I want a chance card. And on these cards, there'll be a yes or a no, or uh, it will add something to it. Like maybe you need help. Uh, so in doubt, just say, let me get a card. There's the other card that adds more randomosity to the game. Uh, there will be cards, for example, that there's a cutscene or there will be something that's haunting you from the past. Maybe we are stepping into a dream and uh, reality shifts. If you are unsure what to do in, a, in any scene, just say, let us add something random to it and see where it goes. I would advise in our five to 10 minutes that we do at least two of these just to get a, a sense of how they work to really test the game. But okay, let's start. Mm, I'll look at my notes and I'm like, <clears throat> um, so the morning rises over Ethros. It's a warm summer day. The heat from the sun lifts the water puddles up. They're floating lightly as they go up to the clouds again where they came from. It's a somber morning in a sense. Yesterday there was a big festival and most people are still sleeping. But there are those who need just get move on in order for the days and the money to come in and to make ends meet. And in this little group of people gathering along the river, the markets, we find Willem, a uh, salesman of vials. And how is your morning today? Um, it's starting slow. I'm just, usually my mornings are quite slow because of the lack of sleep. Um, so, and I have some, a few aches and pains in my back and my arms. So I'm kind of just organizing my cart and starting to move around to check if maybe be given there was a big party last night, some people might still need to sleep at this particular time or for anybody else for tomorrow night, possibly. Oh, absolutely. And um, crawling out from their hidey hole, what is it like, Ashley? Where do you spend the night? I spend the night under a tree, mm -hmm. myself and my unicorn, Violet. 
really creative with the names here. Yes. And uh, she and I are snuggling under a tree, kind of up on the hilltop, taking in yes. the the activities of the festival below. And um, we can see the water, the water puddles rising. We're kind of eye level with them at this point. And um, we're laughing about all of the kind of uh, the shenanigans we were up to in the festival tormenting people knocking things down and um, running around the place and uh, pretty happy with, with how how we got ourselves involved in the festival and um, just taking in the monstrosity of the world below us there was a very unfortunate accident that involved a talking monkey and a pair of books what happened what happened with the talking monkey and books i I'm still figuring that out, but I'm quite yes. pleased with this outcome. I, I think this is going to be a disruption to the town. Oh, but yes, I, the monkeys will talk either. about this for long. Long time. You and might even feature in the newspaper. Mm, I, I, can I be alongside them in the newspaper? I, oh. I feel like that's the credit I want. I want to be yeah. involved with this, uh, I, I guess, mishap. In our daily lives, we now have talking monkey, and I have my talking unicorn, yes. and we we are the talk of the town. And in the morning, one of the things that always happen is that the town criers come out from the newsletter, uh, newspaper uh, building, and they will tell what is the headline of yesterday. And you're sure that today is the day they're going to tell about you. And the fantastic stunt you pulled with the monkeys and the book. Because everyone knows the monkeys here, they love their books. They have a whole little park up in the north where they will sit and read in their trees all day. And, and they'll be like grumpy little faces with their glasses down on their nose. And one of them even runs the library. And there are f frequent visitors into the university even at this point. And... Um, one of them says that he's going to be the greatest writer of all times. And he'll, he's uh, scribbling on pieces of paper that he finds in the trash. And he says, this is going to be the best book. Everyone's going to end up buying my book. And you find him today as you're looking at the puddles rising from the ground. And he's uh, picking up a piece of paper and he starts scribbling. And he says, the best, the best scene I've ever done. This is going to be fantastic. And he keeps muttering for himself with his little pen quill. And he writes... As you see the little boys running out from the newspaper house and they get ready to shout. And what is the headline? Dragon takes over a library. Takes over the, <laughs> the dragon <floor>. takes the <laughs> library, he screams. The dragon has taken over the library. And yes, it has. On top, you can see that little bursts of fire as the little dragon seems to celebrate yesterday's triumph because while everyone in town was at the festival they saw their time to finally take the library outside of the library you can actually probably hear because your park is quite close um the little skittering of the some of the monkeys trying to enter but they're not allowed the dragon is keeping them at bay because the books are now theirs finally but there are other headlines too of the newspaper. And as the town crier spread out of the, of, of the town, Wilhelm, what are the other headlines of today? The other headlines of today are mm, uh, a gang of clocks have stolen, the, have stolen one of the monkey's manuscripts. Oh, a gang of clocks. That is quite a good one. Mm. And how did that go about? Did the clocks gang up from people's houses and decided that now that everyone was busy with the festival, they could finally escape? It's not entirely sure, but they seem to take advantage of the fact that the people were partying during the festival to steal just a few seconds of time. And mm. in that time, they, they, the manuscript disappeared. That is absolutely horrible. The manuscript of the greatest book ever going to be written has disappeared. And um, you might think to yourself that 
you have a friend who's a very good at traveling around and finding things that perhaps this manuscript would be quite valuable to sell in the black market. I mean, mm. the greatest book. Yes. So I can go and ask my friend to obtain, or actually, so wait, where am, am I nearby where, uh, wherever is? you want to be, wherever I want to be. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, well, I want to go talk to the monkey that we were mentioned that you <clears> mentioned <throat> earlier, because seeing that title I, and seeing the monkey who seems to be inspired in writing and close to this little girl with uh, purple hair and a unicorn, presumably, yes. um, I want to go and find out from him if he knows anything about the manuscript and whether he wrote it or if he knows anything about who wrote it. Yes, you approach the monkey and uh, what do you say to him? Um, hi, Mr. Excuse me. I uh, don't want to disturb your writing, but I just... Just, just, just a moment. The greatest, the greatest scene ever written. Uh, absolutely. The... Wait, wait, who are you? Oh, I'm sorry. My name is Willem. I uh, am a purveyor of fine sense for... Oh, I'm not here to buy or anything. I, I'm, I'm, I write. Do you I don't know. See, I understand. See, see, I, I write. I, I, I apologize. I just... But I saw this headline and I was curious as to whether you knew the person who wrote this manuscript, because you seem to be a writer yourself. Manuscript? Did someone take my manuscript? stolen, and was it... Oh, was it yours? It was stolen no by time? told me. I must check my, my library. Maybe someone took my li manuscript. It's such it the was, greatest book ever written. That well, must be mine. Certainly, if it was the greatest book ever written, somebody would have interest in, you know, it would be valuable on the black market and somebody might want to take it. And I have a friend who is pretty good at finding things. So if ever you need my, I mean, his help, perhaps my help. Um, maybe Are you I saying can... you stole my manuscript? No, 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 no. That's not what I do at all. I, I just... I just provide sands for people to have happy dreams and inspiring dreams, in dreams that would give you perhaps the best scene you've ever written, possibly. This is, this is definitely not a happy dream. I want a refund. I, but you haven't bought anything yet. But, what, 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 what who are you? Oh, my name is Willem. I'm a, a purveyor of fine sands. Sand, sand, oh, I can use this. Purveyor of fine sand, ever greatest. Yes, this. Oh, this is going to be such a good scene. This is. Oh, this is. So oh, you're not yes. missing. You're not missing a manuscript, what? right? What? You're Ma not Ma missing a manuscript. Manuscript. Sh oh, where's my manuscript? I was sure I had it here, right in my satchel. <laughs> where's my satchel? Because I point to the headline in the newspaper. That's. I was wondering who. Give if you me knew that. Who that is. The greatest book ever written. Definitely my book. Someone has taken my book. I bet it is that darn dragon. I'll be damned. They shall not have my book in a library. My book is to be read, not to be kept. Wait, who are you? So I thought, can I use it in one of the cards before we wrap up? Yes. I'm thinking. Um, I'd like to convince him that it my, of my good intentions. Oh, Is that okay. something that can be used as a card action thing? Yes. Yeah, so you will state that your intention is to, to convince him. Yes. And um, we have the cards. I've, since I didn't, I, 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 um, I lost some of my cards on my way here. So I will do a dice roll. There are eight different cards. And our dice roll says the first. Your card then is, the characters succeed, but something completely unrelated goes wrong for the character or someone they care about. <gasps> unrelated goes wrong. So, what happens, Ashley? Do you want to define for Willem? Do I want to define what's happened? To, something to, unrelated to this convincing to of the, the manuscript yes somebody had taken over his sand his <gasps> vial has overtaken his shop oh and yes so he no uh, longer has anything to promise as he turns around he sees one of the kids from sandman sneaking around laughing yes. we got it we got <laughs> it we got it <laughs> 
and his cart disappears around a corner. But Willem is happy he did convince the, <laughs> convince the monkey in the end. And how does that go? Convincing the monkey? Yes. That goes... Um, uh, well, that, that goes that he, he understands that I'm trying to help him, even though I come, he doesn't know me at all from nowhere. Yeah. And it accepts to be introduced to the friend I was mentioning that might be able to help him or might know something about where the manuscript is. Mm. Uh, yeah, that's kind of what I'm thinking. And, and yeah. ideally, perhaps rope in Ashley into this somehow. I don't know how. So that we're working, playing together. But I, I am the mastermind behind the fan team taking your... Yes. You were, I, I distracted them. I made you go see the monkey. I gave the monkey one of your little vial of, uh, it was an unfortunate dream that gives him, um, short term memory loss. And so you're cycling your conversation with the monkey while I have the sand people going to destroy or to play tamper with your cart. So I'm watching from afar as I ponder my masterpiece awesome. of, uh, mayhem in front of me. <laughs> Fantastic. And you know that Willem just has this really big heart and he really wants to help the monkey and you just know that this is a perfect setup for him to just stay in a conversation that is going absolutely nowhere until he managed to convince him that I do have good intentions so let me help you find your manuscript. It may or may not turn out to be his manuscript in the end but what really matters here is that the cart has disappeared and he's forgotten all about it for a moment because you know he's going to help someone cool are we okay can we wrap up there yeah we can fantastic and it's not that i don't want to keep going it's, it's just really <laughs> because we gave ourselves a, like a limited time yes we uh, and i really clock people exactly for those <laughs> clock people i mean if they were stealing a little bit more time for us this was awesome. Thank you so much, Dina. This was fantastic. You're welcome. Um, Ashley, like, what, uh, yeah, what does this evoke for you? What are you thinking? And particularly in, in, in anything that comes to mind on your idea of where you could go looking or, or what you can learn for the idea of perhaps including playful elements or game-like things or games in workshops, uh, in the workshop ideas that you were thinking of and that you mentioned at the beginning. Um, well, I will say I, I, I really enjoyed the idea of um, some realistic element that I could relate to and then bringing myself into this fantasy element um, and kind of playing those together so it could feel a little bit realistic while also far-fetched. And I think that um, you know, we talk a lot about, I think as adults, you, or at least for me, I, it was um, probably middle school, high school before I started to really absorb the fact that I may be perceived different than other people. And I think when you're a kid, you know, you fall, you scrape your knee, you get right back up, you're fine. Like our, our, um, our kind of lingering thoughts on things as children is very different as, than as we grow up. And I think that these elements of the game where you get to kind of go back to your childhood imagination of, of um, wonderment um, really can put you into literally into like the shoes of somebody else or some something different and that that can really be translated into reality when we are communicating and interacting with people different from from ourselves or interacting with people of a different culture or different backgrounds and um, there is a commonality that we can all enjoy some fun element something that feels so off from what we know um, and so I don't know if that, that answered the question. I feel like I kind yeah. of went on. It really did. There. I think it was awesome. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you. I really enjoyed it. And I, I know that I like, and I was suspecting strongly having conversations with friends who told me I would really enjoy you guys, that I, I would definitely want to play full on. And, um, and thank you so much for giving us a little bit of a flavor of the way the game starts and, I find it's exciting and I really like those kinds of things in the first place because I like connecting things that don't seem to that should that don't seem like they should be 
uh, and that's something that I particularly like in anything in life. Uh, and going, one of the best compliments I've ever been given was a friend of mine who told me, Willem, I really love to be with you because I know that you can, I can take you to a really fancy five-star hotel cocktail party or in like an artist squat with like punks and dogs and whatever, whatever the situation, you're going to mingle and be fine with whoever you meet. And that's one aspect. And I really like just mixing different things together and having all those kind of varied experiences and also going behind the scenes. And I find that mixing things together that feel like they shouldn't like clocks and monkeys writing books and dreams and sand in this strange city. Uh, it's kind of like, it feels like looking at the behind the scenes of what's going on in people's heads and just trying to bring it out a little bit. And, uh, and also I would say during the lockdown, it was important for me to be playing games and it was a really great reminder to both practice imagination, like you were saying, Ashley. And lately in the past couple of months since the lockdown, I've been even more worried about work and income and there's been some family health issues and a lot of concerns and a little bit less games with the summer and it was just to, even just this little bit was a good reminder of how important it is to have moments of playfulness and imagination and it's something to be practiced and cherished it might sound a bit grandiose but i think it's important no yeah i get it i have a attention deficit disorder and i use uh, games as a way of uh, managing my hyperactivity so as long as I get one or two game sessions a week, I'm fine. Like I can function normally. Uh, uh, otherwise, yeah, I, I get the stuff done that needs to be done. And I don't really struggle with, you know, executive functions as much. Uh, whenever I, I uh, fall back and I don't get to play as much, like during lockdown and my quarantine, you know, I, I, uh, I tend to, you know, my hyperactivity is a little bit worse. <laughs> Anything else for you, Dina, on, on running the game for us or, yeah, like, or your experience I, of it or anything you want to add? I, I love this sort of thing. You know, like, uh, give me a prompt and I will run just about anything. It's, yeah. uh, it's really the style of, of me as a game master is this sort of game. So I think they allow me to, you know, unleash all that stuff that usually happens in the ADHD brain and just like, okay, like this is... I can just push it out there and, and usually, you know, the reception is quite good. Yeah. Cool. I, I would add, I, I've been looking at for my podcast previously, I had kind of straight up interview conversations with people from my professional environment and always looking for ways while well, I'm progressing more in that direction to mix in both my passion for gaming and to share it with my professional environment as well. Uh, and, a lot of people, and, and this is more perhaps when, if you have any comments, great, but perhaps more for anybody listening to this who might be more belonging to my professional kind of communications, advertising, marketing environment. There's so much talk about storytelling, but not that much practice. So playing these kinds of games is also an opportunity to practice the storytelling that we talk about in professional environments that is not always, I mean, sometimes it's talk about rather than actually do it. <laughs> Uh, and well, that's another area that I really like. And just even in this little bit, you get that you get a whole world and you get the whole world of this city that we're creating little bit by little bit. Um, and how important it is for about to practice anything, basically, I guess is what I'm saying. So, yeah. And I feel that this is more of the conversation we just had is more may well be more of interest to all my friends who do role playing games and listen to a little bit less of my stuff that might be more, you know, professional or business oriented i'm trying to find ways to mix both of them together at various degrees so thank you again for joining me for this um yeah, yeah. and any last comments and also where can we oh actually i forgot i do have a couple of last questions as well <laughs> before we end uh because it's the ice cream for everyone podcast uh one so in the, i have these cool down questions at the end that i was like forgetting because i'm managing the time do you like ice cream and do you have a favorite ice cream flavor Ashley, I'll let you go first. Sure. Um, <laughs> ooh, this is tricky. I, I do like ice cream, although I've been uh, eating less sugar lately, so I, I am missing that. Um, I, I, I go to like safe bet always the chocolate chip cookie dough. I like the crunchy kind of doughiness of it. Um, 
but I, I also um, lately they've had at the shop here in LA they have an almond olive oil like vanilla ice cream that actually the pairings are really well done um, wow. and so I do enjoy that one that sounds interesting how about you Dina? Mm, yummies I absolutely love ice creams maybe not as much as my kid because he will literally eat ice cream every single day for every <laughs> single meal but that is a three-year-old for you uh but i am yeah huge lover of ice cream i will use any opportunity i can with other people to have ice cream uh whenever applicable uh, i will never eat ice cream alone that is a thing that i have i just cannot do it uh, it needs company uh, my like big thing is that when I lived in the UK, I we used to get these um, Reese's Cups ice creams that they had. I don't get them here, unfortunately. Though I'm quite happy that my little village here in in north of Finland recently started getting more Ben and Jerry's in. So at least I I get close. Um, and now with the uh, with Ben and Jerry doing the whole marketing thing uh, around the Black Lives Matter, um, I was like, yes, this is my opportunity to get more Ben and Jerry's. So I went out and I got like ten different ones just because. Um, so awesome. yeah, um, I'm not sure what my favorite flavor would be though. Um, quite possibly something with caramels and and vanilla or chocolate ice cream. Very nice. Uh, one more. What's the last uh, last piece of art or media that really had an impact on you that you'd like to share or you know recommend to others? And that could be anything from a game to a TV show to a painting to a book to whatever. Like, um, I actually, the um, Nike came out with a new ad yesterday, um, and the the like the sports ad, and it just having worked in entertainment, having worked in post-production, the, the entire element of the from the writing, the copywriting, the storytelling, to the actual editing is just phenomenal. Is that the one um, with the split screen? Yes, it's I split screen. I just saw it like and, 10 minutes before we started recording. Yeah, it's, it's so cool. It, I think it's called, um, I can't remember the official name of it, but the, um, and I have I'm playing sports all my life. Like I've always felt like sports have a really, um, powerful way of bringing people together and having played soccer specifically soccer is the world sport um this ad just uh, had like hit so many emotions and um, from a technical standpoint it's phenomenal the way the like the cut the editing and and so um i would say that's probably with literally within the last 24 hours one of the most um amazing pieces i've seen the editing is amazing. I'll send it to you and I'll add it to the show notes for anybody watching or listening. But just for the sake of explaining, the, the edit has a split screen with uh, athletes doing all kinds of sports and but different kinds of sports. But the movement is seamless between one side of the screen and the other. But even though they're doing different sports, it's different people. But all the movement happens between the split screen. If that makes sense. And it's all the whole inspiring thing about we'll find a way to make sports work, even though we don't know how that's going to happen. Yeah, it's mm, called so the new normal. It's called thing. you can't stop us. It's yeah, it's, it's like you can't stop sport, and then they cross out sport and write us. And so there's just like this really cool kind of like unity community element to it. Cool. Thank that you. sounds amazing. I have to check it out as a you know as a community <laughs> specialist. <laughs> that sounds really cool. How about you, Dina? Mm, I think I'm gonna go with a a game. A computer game it's called Valhalla and in it you play a bartender in this sort of uh, futuristic world uh, serving drinks to people and some of the customers in the game are absolutely obnoxious and some of them have really sweet stories and you're really you know you're a struggling bartender to trying to make ends meet and you're just you know uh, in a shitty place really the pub you work in isn't the, the you know that isn't really up and coming and it's kind of you know low key and uh, it's just amazing the stories within the game that unrolls as you play it in this really sort of um, slow pace day-to-day -day living inside the game is just absolutely brilliant um, so many of the characters and the plots that they come in with is uh, it's like a dream unfolding really slowly and you know the character is trying to to pay rent and uh, 
and uh, gets a song stuck on their head and uh, have to manage the jukebox and clean up after parties. And it's just uh, very much text adventure is. And uh, I've been really enjoying it lately. And every time I open up the game, I'm like, wow, this is so cool. Awesome. I'll check it out. I'll have to mm. check it out. I'll put it on the show notes. Thank you. So much role-playing elements that it's just, uh, they've done it so perfectly. As I, I used to work as a bartender uh, and uh, it's, uh, it's like being back at work, but with all the nice things, I don't have to actually clean or anything. I just get to listen to the music and uh, have people tell me stories. Awesome. Cool. Thank you so much for joining me for this. Any last words? And also like, where can people find you or find information about different things that you might have mentioned that you're interested in or that you're into. Um, and I'll also, of course, add that to the show notes and the links in the both YouTube video and the audio version only. Who wants to go first? Ashley or do you, Ashley? Ashley, Switch. sure. Yeah. Um, I, I wanted to touch yeah, of course. really quickly on- Yeah, yeah, for, add anything the, that you'd like to, of course. The, um, you mentioned the, the idea of practicing, like creativity yeah. and removing yourself. And I think what's great about games and role playing is that it feels less forced rather than sitting down and writing something or trying, like it feels like less forced or scripted work. Um, and it feels you know, more fun. And then you start to kind of relay that back to, to work environments and having taken some strategy courses and, and online, um, yeah, courses like that. Sometimes it can feel a bit more like contrived and like you have to sit there and really think about it versus the game feels a little bit more free. And so um, I really enjoyed that element of, of this and um, how that can be kind of translated into a work sphere, but less than a, to your point, Dina, less than a, um, like I had to fit a certain box, right? To fit, the cool box or the, the cool factor. And so um, just wanted to reiterate that point. Um, to find me, I, I'm on Instagram, I'm on Facebook, although I don't use that as much. And I, I, I'm definitely probably one of the few people that doesn't use Twitter. Um, but I have my website, as we mentioned at the beginning of all of this, it's deaf, tattooed, and employed, all spelled out, or um, Ashley C. Darrington, all spelled out. And um, yeah, I think the Instagram and the website, they're probably the, the easiest way to find me. Fantastic, thank you. Yeah, I'm like one of those people who are like everywhere, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, I did some, I do some costume designing and I do a lot of sewing. I used to do pattern testing for an Australian company. So you'll find me on Instagram under Dina said Sue. S E W. And on Twitter, I'll be on Dina said so because <laughs> I, sp I speak a lot. Yeah, I, I'm a blabbermouth. And I'm also on Instagram under Gamer Valkyrie where I post more about my gaming adventures, um, mostly board games, but also the role playing games where I um, share a little bit about my upcoming role playing game that will be coming out soon. Ooh. hopefully <laughs> it's uh, you know play test so um, i'll be trying to get some people to play that with me and um yeah um uh i'm on facebook in like every single board gaming group that there is i'm quite easy to get hand ha, hand ha, there. Mm, i'm easy to find i Great. make so, sure so <laughs> fantastic thank you so much for your time oh yeah and obviously it was B is itrasb.com. They have a web page. You can buy the game in like German and Finnish and English and whatever. If you're more interested in what's in the Norwegian scene, there, there was this Norwegian style book that came out uh, some years ago uh, called Norwegian Style. Uh, there's an ontology um, that can still be bought. It's really awesome. It has all these really short games that you can run, which is these sort of styled with the storytelling aspects of it. Uh, some have cards, some have don't. Uh, common with them all is that there's no dice. You can bring it with you everywhere. Check it out. Uh, I would definitely recommend checking it out. It's the best thing that ever came out of the Norwegian scene, I think. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> awesome. Fantastic. Thank you. All right. Well, that was a really great episode. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you enjoyed discovering everything to do with Ashley and Dina and the game eTrust B and 
wanting to find out more perhaps about role-playing games, storytelling games, or the hard of hearing and looking at how do you make your content more accessible for people that are deaf and hard of hearing. And uh, don't forget, you can like, like, subscribe, give it a five-star review if you're listening to this on the podcast. And uh, you can find everything to do with me if you want to work with me in the future, find out about my workshops or how I work at www.icecreamforeveryone.net. So that's everything spelled out, Ice Cream for Everyone. Or on Twitter or Instagram, uh, at ICVillem, letters I and C for ice cream. W-I-L-L-E-M. That's about it. Good night, morning, afternoon, what time of day or night, whatever time of day or night it is for you. Thanks for watching and see you next time.